If you want my notes this morning, you can text the word notes to the number that comes on the screen. What comes in front of me will be sent to you. I will let you know that I have the most notes I think I've ever had. I have like a Heather Schott sermon right here. I mean, I got the most notes that, I've, that I, I have ever had, and I'm sending them to you. I've been out of the pulpit for about five weeks, so I'm ready to go. Who's ready to eat this morning? First Kings chapter 3. Beginning in verse 16, it says, Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Oh, my Lord, this woman, I live in the same house. I gave birth to a child and wife. She was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were alone. There was no one else in the house. Only it was the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she laid on him. And when she arose in midnight... She took my son from beside me while your servant slept, and she laid it on her breast and then laid her son that was dead on my breast. When I rose from the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. For the other woman said, no, the living child is mine and the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one who... The one says, this is my son is alive and your son is dead. The other said, no, it is your son that is dead and my son that is alive. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king, verse 25. And the king said, divide the living child in two. Give half to one and half to the other. Verse 26. The woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned to her son, oh my Lord, give her the living child. By no means put him to death. But the other one said, he shall neither be mine nor yours divide him verse 27 the king answered and said give the living child to the first woman by no means put him to death she is the mother I came to tell you this morning the heart's cry of a good steward is it will never be mine it will always be yours the title of this message this morning is the value of stewardship let's pray So Holy Spirit, we declare that this place is yours. We declare this house is yours. We declare we don't make room for you. We give you the entire room. Lord, I declare right now for your word to go forward and accomplish all that it's set out to do. We declare it's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We declare that your word is true and that every man's a liar. I pray right now that you would breathe your spirit upon your logos word, your written word. I pray you'd become alive right now. Holy Spirit, would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us hearts to receive? Would you give us minds to understand what your spirit is saying? Father, we declare no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. We say fear, you have to go. We say greed, you have to go. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name, I thank you that nobody came to hear me. We all came to hear you, so we say speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And all God's people said amen Amen. and amen. The Lord spoke to the eldership and said the year 2022 is the year of expanding territory. He told us it was the first Chronicles 4.10 year. Oh, that he would bless us indeed. Expand our territory. Put his hand of favor upon us and keep us from evil. We're encouraging you to pray that over your lives and your families every single day. This is a supernatural prayer of expanding territory. This is a prayer where you're saying, Lord, you determine the blessing and you determine my response response to this blessing. And I wanted to let you know that as your pastor, I am proud of this community. I've heard so many reports of people saying, hey, we didn't think that we could buy a house, but you said it was a year, or God said it was a year of expanding territory, and we've partnered with that word, and we already closed on the house. I've heard businessmen that are saying, we're buying land, we're building houses. God spoke to us about this property. God spoke to us about this business. I am watching you walk by faith, and It's exciting to be in this community with so many people that are full of faith. This morning, I wanted to talk about one of the greatest revelations that God has given me in the last 10 years. I'd say this is probably a top three revelation. This word has changed my life personally. I want to be very careful with this because it's almost like any Sunday or any service you go to, someone says this is life changing and it's really like a hoopla to encourage people. I want to let you know that this word has changed my entire life. 
And I believe that this word has the potential to change your life. I believe that if you partner with this prophetic word, you will have the resources to supernaturally expand the territory that God is calling you to expand. I want to thank publicly Pastor Robert Morris of Gateway and Gateway Church for introducing me to the revelation of stewardship. Pastor Robert, we honor you, and because of what you have sown into the body of Christ, I am a benefactor, Mercy Culture is a benefactor, Waco is a benefactor, everything that we touch because of this. Now, I grew up in a, a, a congregation, or I grew up in a church that we never talked about stewardship. The reason why we're calling this the value of stewardship, because at Mercy Culture, we have a very intentional culture. Some people mock it and make fun of it, but I went to church for almost 20 years and couldn't tell you the vision of our church. I couldn't tell you what we were doing. I couldn't tell you where we were going as a congregation. And we want to be very, very sure that you understand the vision of Mercy Culture is... It, that helps you. I don't think they had that up at the 830 service. They just knew it. Our culture is made up of four elements. You, you see them all over the walls. You, you, you hear us talk about them constantly. Four elements. It's the vision of mercy culture. Take people from corporate encounters with God to daily personal encounters with God. Ask me why that's the vision. Because people don't make it without a personal relationship with God. This is why people backslide. This is why people fall away. Because their relationships with the man and not the man. And so we're not drawing people to us, we're drawing people to God. Then we have our values, then we have our unique characteristics, what makes mercy culture unique or different, not better, but different, and what our, our leadership standards are. And so the Lord spoke to us and said that we were supposed to add a value of stewardship. We announced it on Vision Sunday, and I'm going to teach the message of value of stewardship today. So here is the value, we call it the third option. Stewardship is managing heaven's or the kingdom's resources for the Father's business. The heart's cry of a good steward is it will never be mine, it will always be yours. When given the choice between an ownership or an employment mentality, we choose the third option, we choose stewardship. So I grew up in a church that only taught on giving by faith, sowing and reaping and generosity. I want to be very, very clear how I articulate this. I believe in sowing in faith. I believe in hearing God and obeying. I believe in generosity. I believe that generosity reflects the kingdom of God. But here's the problem, is if you're constantly sowing, if you're giving generously and giving faithfully and you're not seeing breakthrough or favor, there is a chance, like me, you were never taught stewardship. And I would argue theologically that stewardship is mentioned in God's word as much as generosity, if not more. It just hides behind words like faithfulness. And so when I was taught that it's all you had to do is give by faith and, and God would bless you, press down, shake together and run it over. Come on, you know these scriptures if you grew up in church. Maybe you were in services that someone stood in a line to give this amount of money, and a line to give that amount of money, and a line to give this kind of money. Come on, anyone else needed he inner healing after <laughs> being in dysfunctional situations? We believe that God speaks to people's hearts. They hear and obey and give. If you notice at Mercy Culture, we don't take time in the service to even take up tithes and offerings. Now, here, but here's the thing, is that I was only taught one side of it. I would call generosity the right arm. But I was never taught stewardship, which is the left arm. It's what balances it out. And there's so many people that are missing out on the favor of God because they have not learned to be a good steward. What is stewardship? Stewardship is from a, a Greek word, egonomae, which means managing a household. It means where one person looks after another's affairs or resources. So our definition is this, managing the resources of heaven or the kingdom for the Father's business. Here's what you need to understand about stewardship. If you don't understand this, you can never steward well. Is that everything belongs to the Lord, we're only managers. 
I'm going to say it again because it's going to take a while to get this in you. Everything belongs to the Lord. We are only managers or stewards. Psalms 24.1 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all of its people belong to him. It is impossible to steward well if you don't understand this principle that everything belongs to God. And the, if you think about it, the things that you have a hard time stewarding are the areas that you think that they belong to you. Even the word Lord in the Greek means ownership. Every time we say the word Lord, we are saying you are the owner. And you can't go one, one book of the Bible without seeing this principle of stewardship. How about in the beginning, Adam was entrusted to steward everything in the garden. How about Noah was entrusted to steward the future of humanity? How about Abraham was entrusted to steward a promised land? How about Joseph was entrusted to steward a prophetic dream? How about Moses was entrusted to steward the people of Israel? How about David was entrusted to steward the presence of God? How about the disciples? Disciples were entrusted to steward the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Or Paul was entrusted to steward the New Testament church. Or Jesus was entrusted to steward the will of the Father. This is a theme that goes all throughout scriptures. It's just an underlying theme. Do you know that we're responsible to steward our lives well? Every area of your life. Tell two or three people every area of your life. You are entrusted to steward your finances or your resources. The reason why we call this the third option is because I'm kind of a leadership junkie. I love leadership. I love leadership podcasts and books. And I'm always looking for new stuff. And, 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 and there's this ongoing debate of, of the, an ownership mentality versus an employment mentality. And there's this debate that goes on. And people talk about it. How do you get people to get an ownership mentality? Sometimes they call it a founder's mentality. And, and there's this battle or this, this struggle to convince people to act like owners. And I've been talking to my friends and our team about this for about two years one day I was on a prayer run and I said to the Lord, how do we get people to, to, to go from an employment mentality to an ownership mentality? And I heard the Lord say, you don't. I'm like, well, I just wasted two years of a lot of conversations. Well, well, what do I do? He said, you get them both to become stewards. You get the owners that think it's theirs because their name is on it to become stewards and understand that it doesn't belong to them, it belongs to the Lord. Even the deed that their name is on was made by the papers from the trees that belong to him. See, you have to take the owners and make sure the owners understand that it's not their job to lord over anyone. It's their job to steward everything that the Lord entrusts them to manage. And then you don't try to get an employer, uh, an employment mentality or worker mentality to try to, you know, work harder and act like you own it. No, no, no. They are the steward too. And everything that they've been entrusted to, it is their responsibility to steward. I was on a prayer run and the Lord said, there's a third option. Between an owner's mentality and employment mentality, there is a stewardship mentality. And all of us, despite where we are, are responsible to steward well, we're responsible to steward relationships. You are responsible to steward your family well. Can I pastor you for a moment? If you're frustrated with your family, steward it better. I, 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 I was sentenced to youth ministry for years. But it's okay, the Lord delivered me. It was about 10 years. And I would talk to these parents all the time that thought that their children were, they were supposed to be their children's friends. And, 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 and most parents that feel like their primary responsibility is to be their kids' friends usually have rebellious kids. And, and I would have to tell these parents all the time, hey, they're 14. And if you don't parent for the next four years, you're going to have decades of rebellion that you're going to be dealing with if you allow it to remain right now. I would tell them all the time, it's like this, like, pff, epiphanies, you are the parent. But here's the thing you need to understand is you are the steward. 
You are the steward of your children. You are the steward of your marriage. Business guy running around looking at all these other marriages wishing you had something better. You have not stewarded your marriage well. If you want what everyone else has, you are a bad steward. You've lost the fire in your marriage. Oh, pastor, we just were falling out of love. No, you're not stewarding well. You're going to too many soccer games, not enough date nights. <laughs> you have to steward relationships well. As I prayed for you this week, I felt two things in my spirit. Some of you are stewarding bad relationships that bear no fruit that you need to let go of. There's, a, there, there's a, a, a story in Luke chapter 13 that the master goes to a servant and says, this tree bears no fruit, cut it down. The, master, the servant said, give me one more year to produce fruit. If it doesn't produce fruit, I'll cut it down. Some of you have let years go by of unfruitful relationships that you need to cut down. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying, I wonder why I'm not expanding territory this year. Because you don't have the people around you that will take the land with you. Some of you, God has brought God relationships into your life that you have not stewarded well. And do you know that the enemy will always come to destroy, to kill, steal, and destroy God-ordained relationships. This happened with us with Pastor Les and Nikki Cody. We've been best friends with them for about 16 years. But there was a few year period of time where we allowed a Jezebelic situation, a Jezebelic spirit that was partnered with, with the Jezebelic leader. And they said bad things about the Cody's to us. And then they told the Cody's bad things about uh, back and forth. And they sowed seeds of discord in between us. Now, it's interesting because I believe the spirit of offense realized that the Cody's and the shots would need to be unified in 2022 for what is on his heart in a city of Waco. But if there was seeds of discord that were sown in that season that bared, that, that bared fruit or that lasted, it would have been destroyed. Les called me one day. And he said, why aren't we friends? I was like, what do you mean? We're friends. He goes, no, no, no. We're not friends like we used to be. And I said, I don't know. I turned to Heather. I said, why aren't we friends? And she's like, I don't know. Why aren't we friends? He had a little intercessor lady who prayed for him that asked him, hey, where's Landon? Why aren't you friends with Landon? And he said, I don't know. Watch. We allowed a spirit of offense. Ah, that wasn't even our offense. Isn't it interesting that people that don't even belong to this community have opinions about what you're doing in this community? Isn't it interesting that people that are not walking arm in arm with you taking territory? Isn't it interesting that the spies that don't walk in faith to scout out the land and the reports that they bring back? Could it be that the enemy knows what you're called to do in this season and 2022 and the territory that you're called to take? I believe that there are some kingdom friendships that you've let time go by that you need to steward better. Hmm. I, I felt this as I was praying to my spirit. I feel like I'm supposed to caution you because some of you have been sowing into bad ground and you've called it generosity, but I believe the Lord is calling it poor stewardship. I'll say that again. There was this situation where there was an individual that I was going to sow into. I felt like I was supposed to bless. And it was a significant offering. And I went to go give a significant blessing to this individual. And the Lord said, don't give it. He said, it's bad stewardship. If you are sowing into bad ground, or bad relationships, it's bad stewardship. Some of you need to steward your health and energy. You don't steward yourself, you don't Sabbath. 
The Sabbath is the only commandment that the Christian willingly breaks. There's no other commandment that people are like, oh, no, it's cool if I murder. We're under grace. It's the New Testament. But you say stuff like, we got one life to live, and we're going to get people saved. That's not true. You're not getting people saved all day long. That's not what you're doing. You're watching Netflix. <laughs> you're working long hours. People say this all the time. Well, I, I, I tithe my time. There's actually no scripture that supports that. You Sabbath your time. And you manage your health. The Lord taught me about managing my helmet, uh, my, my helmet, my health <laughs> through Pastor Matt Seville. And, and we were training for the justice run. Now, I'd only run about nine miles ever in, in, in one run. And, and, and so I'm getting up to like 12, 13, 14 miles. And I get to that 14 mile mark and I feel like I'm dying. Like my body just stops working. Like one leg just won't go. Like, like, like I'm like, do what I tell you to do, body. It just wouldn't work. And, 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 and Matt has issues. He has ran, like, he's done, like, eight Ironmans and, like, 30 marathons. He's done ultra marathons. Like, he's ran 50 miles in a day. That's not normal. <laughs> and so I was telling Matt, I was like, yeah, I'm trying to get ready. My, my, and, and when you start getting past 15 miles, it's not about running anymore. It's about survival. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a, on, a, like, a, a, an episode of some, like, TV show. It's just about surviving at this point. And he said, well, are you eating on your run? I'm like, like what? Like Pastor Steve stopping in the middle of a marathon and getting fast food? What are you talking about? <laughs> True story. People are like, what are you doing here, Pastor Steve? This is the Justice Marathon going on right now. Listen. <laughs> He's a politician. You got to watch out for him. I was like, what do you mean eat in the middle of the run? He's like, no, no, no. He goes, you have to be eating while you're running. I'm like, how do you do that? He's like, oh, you take these gels and all these different things. And, 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 and so this is disgusting. Like you just try to squeeze it down, try to not puke it up. It's, it's awful. It's horrible. It's, it's torture. <laughs> but what I did, he said, every mile you have to feed yourself. So I'm on the run. I got this giant backpack with all of these things. <laughs> And every mile, I, and then I realized on 16, on 17, on 18, and 19, and mile 20, I could still go. Here's what he said. He said, you got to trick your body. You have to feed yourself before you realize you need it. See, some of you are not stewarding your daily encounter. And so you're doing great in solemn assembly. You do great on the 40-day, 21-day fast. You do great through January. You do pretty good through February. But you hit the wall of March because you're hungry. You're spiritually hungry. And then you say stuff like, I just need to go to church and eat. But you forgot that grown-ups feed themselves. They're called daily encounters. And you feed yourself on a regular basis. Watch so you you never lose your spiritual strength. Some of you need to learn how to steward prophetic words. Some people running around chasing prophetic word after prophetic word after YouTube channel. Of chasing prophetic words. But it doesn't matter how many prophetic words you get because you don't obey them. Do you know how you steward prophetic words? You obey them. You steward prophetic words by keeping in front of you as a lens in your decision-making process. You know how we steward prophetic words? We were in a high school called Pasco High School. Our church was just a few months old, and I stood on the stage of that, uh, that auditorium, and I declared out, fear go, Holy Spirit come. And it wasn't a one-time prayer. It became a continual prayer. That prayer led us to a, a, a sign on the building, fear go, Holy Spirit come. And then it ended up on someone's shirt, fear go, Holy Spirit come. And then Pastor Jasmine on one Sunday morning started singing out, fear go, Holy Spirit come. And all of a sudden, watch, we started stewarding. Ah. You thought it was a song. 
It's a prophetic word. You can have it all. It's not a song. It's a heart's cry of a good steward that says it all belongs to you. Some of you need to steward your mind and your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I used to do this Tuesday Q&A. And some people say there's no such thing as a dumb question. You've never done a weekly Tuesday Q&A. <laughs> so I moved it to monthly so I can handle it. No, the truth is, it was, it was poor stewardship of my time. So I moved it to once a month. And someone asked me this question, and they said, Pastor, is it okay if I have a separate bank account in case my marriage doesn't work? That was a real question. No. No. But that wasn't a money problem. That was a take every thought captive problem. So every time you think my marriage isn't going to work, I grab that thought and I bring it back to the altar where I said to death do us part, where I said I promise to love, honor, and cherish. I promise to serve in sickness and in health. Listen, when I don't feel like it, people say I fell out of love. That's okay. Perfect love is not a love of feeling. It's a love of choice. I was so glad, watch, when Jesus did not feel like dying on a cross for me, that he stood suspended between heaven and earth because he chose to love us well we have to steward our thought life hmm. you have to steward your body it's interesting that we hear a lot about sex drugs and rock and roll in church but not a lot about the golden corral I am legion. There are many in there. <laughs> Pastor, the enemy's just attacking me so much. He's just coming. I, I had this lady uh, on, on, on the plane who was not healthy, and she was looking at me like I'm going to kill her just sitting next to her. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just sat here. As soon as I sat down, she's like, ah. <laughs> you have to steward your body. I have a friend who would really, really struggle with his weight. Massive. I mean, like, intense. And he said, Landon, would you help keep me accountable? And I said, absolutely. So I started praying for him. And the Lord showed me a vision. What is a vision? It's a, it's a spiritual daydream. And he gives me this spiritual daydream about him. And I saw the call of God on his life and everything that he was called to do. But he could not do it because he physically couldn't even get there to do it. Some of you need to steward your body's well. Now let's talk about this perversion. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. First, first Corinthians 6, 19. Here's what it says. You are not your own. Here's the problem. When you partner with the worldly theology that says my body, my choice. When scripture says you are not your own. I was praying for you this week. And the Lord reminded me of a prophetic word that God was going to expand people's territory this year in freedom, especially when it came to sexual bondage and perversions. And here's what I felt the Lord tell me, that some of you do not have a temptation problem, you have a stewardship problem. Because something comes and tempts you and you don't realize you don't own that. Oh, I'm, I'm helping someone get free right now. When something comes across your path that your flesh is enticed to, you need to steward your mind and body, and the response is, that's not mine, that's the Lord's. Some of you need to learn how to steward these prophetic words. Remember I just talked about stewarding prophetic words? So you steward when you get tempted. You steward it. Some of you need to take that iPhone and cast it out before the eye... Scripture says if your eye causes you to stumble, some of you, it's your iPhone. 
You have to steward this. Ah, I, if you get this, your marriage is going to get freedom. Listen, when you steward your mind, when you steward your thoughts, when you steward your body, you ready for this? When you steward everything, God will breathe his favor on it. Matthew chapter 25, it's the story of the talents or the good stewards and the bad steward. The theme of this parable of Jesus is that you will give an account for what you're entrusted with. It says this in verse 14. For it will be like a man on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. Say entrusted. Verse 15, it says, to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and one he gave one a talent according to his ability. This is important because some of you are mad at other people for what you have in life when you have a stewardship issue. I was going through a season of stupidity in my 20s. And I would have these freak out moments. Some of you people know what, what I'm talking about. When you're like 26 and you're like, I'm not married yet. You start freaking out. You know what I mean? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor say, relax. <laughs> and so I would feel pressure. I would feel weight. I'd feel responsibility. And I would say to the Lord, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. And it was like this speech I had with the Lord constantly. It just, I, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. I can't handle this. And I'm driving my car one day and the Holy Spirit said, you realize you're asking me not to bless you. I'm like, no, it's not what I said. I said, I can't handle it. I didn't ask you not to bless me. He said, no, you're asking me not to give you more. I was like, what do I say then? He goes, ask me for the ability to handle more. Some of you are frustrated with what you've been given when you just need an ability to handle more. That word entrusted, this is really important. That word entrusted, the master entrusted is the word parathizome, which means close beside, to turn over, to deliver with the sense of close personal involvement. This is really important. Close personal involvement. To be entrusted with something means close personal involvement. I need to give a warning to you because some of you are close to what God has entrusted you with and because you're so close to it, you think it's yours. Because you gave birth to them. Because you have the passwords to the accounts it's in. Because you sleep there every night. Because you drive it to work every day. Because you're so close to it. You thought it was yours. Do you know the main reasons why people do not tithe. It's either they're greedy, they're afraid, or they're poor stewards. Most people have a hard time. Now, when I taught on this in the 830 service, I felt this demonic pushback as I talked. So I'm leaning in good. Do you know we don't take tithes and offerings at Mercy Culture? People just give and obey God on a regular basis. And our giving compared to the average church in America is just astounding how obedient our church is. It's amazing. But it's so important that we teach on this. See, if you're greedy, you'll find any YouTube fake theologian or Facebook prophet that will confirm your greed. If you're afraid, you're going to have to get delivered from a spirit called fear before you learn how to trust God with your money, your life, and everything. But majority of people, I hear this more than anything, don't tithe because they say, I can't afford it. And the only reason why you can't afford it is because God's last. Watch. You can never not afford the person or thing you give first. And you give to first what you love the most. The tithe in the word of God 
is in biblical numerics is the tenth part. It means a testimony, a test, law, or responsibility. I'm going to go fast through this. A lot of people say tithing is Old Testament. By saying it's Old Testament, you're referring to the law. The law was written by God and given to Moses. But the tithe predated the law when it was first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 when Abraham tithed a tenth that he had because he had such an intimate relationship with God, he knew what God wanted. Then in Leviticus 27, it says it belongs to the Lord. Would someone say belongs to the the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. That means this. Some of you have in your bank account what belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 3 says this, that we're to give our first and best. We honor the Lord with the first fruits of all of our crops. See, you can never not afford to give God or pay your tithe or bring your tithe when you give to God first. See, here's the problem. Some people that struggle with money or don't have a lot of money, they struggle because they put God last. But what I've noticed is that wealthy people have the same struggle. They just wait to give their tithe or they withhold it. So they say stuff like, well, I, I, I'm just going to really pray about where I'm supposed to give my tithe. You, you, you give it to your local church. You bring it to the storehouse. That's what you do. Your tithe doesn't go to the Red Cross, great organization. It doesn't go at, to any other thing. It goes to the local church. It goes to the storehouse, Scripture says. Well, hold on. But I've noticed a pattern with some people that they hold on to it. And here's the thing. Is delayed obedience is still disobedience. Here's what the Bible says in Exodus 29, or 22, 29. It says, do not delay to offer the first of your right fruits. See, do not delay means I give when I feel led to. A lot of people say, well, well where did Jesus talk about tithing? Matthew 23, 23, it's up on the screen. <laughs> Jesus said, you should tithe, yes, but don't neglect more important things. You need to understand this, especially people that are young in their faith, is that when you withhold the tithe, you're robbing from God. Malachi 3, 8 says, will a man rob me? Yes, you rob me in tithes and offerings. It says, you are under curse the whole nation because of you. What is the curse of robbing God? You never have enough. You get raises and you don't have enough. It's like, it, 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 it's gone all the time and you, you don't even know why. It, it's almost like a devourer comes. It says, bring the whole tithe in my storehouse. See if they will test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. You know what happens when you don't have room for it? You have to get a bigger storehouse. No, no. When you don't have room for it, your territory must be expanded. Mm. This is important you understand this, mercy culture. Your money reflects your heart posture towards God. If you get upset when we never take offerings, when I teach on tithes and offerings, you have a money problem. Let me ask you this question. How are we going to expand territory when we rob from God? Can I just pass you for a second? One of the worst things I've ever heard from the pulpit is someone say at one time, hey, if you can't, if you can't, if you're not there at 10% of your tithe, just give your best. That's like saying, if you, if you can't be faithful to your wife. How many know that everything belongs to the Lord and God doesn't need money? He wants your heart. Matthew 25, it says this. Now after a long time, the master of the servants came back and he settled accounts with them. The one who received five talents came and brought and said, Master, look, you delivered me five talents here. I have made five more. His master said, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I'll make you ruler or set you over much. I'm going to expand your territory. Enter into the joy of your master. The one that had two said, look, master, you gave me two. I've given you two more. He said the same thing. 
Verse 24, it says, and the one who had received one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering seed. I was afraid, so I went and hid it in the ground. Here's what belongs to you. He said, I knew you were a hard man. Here's the thing, that word knew means intimacy. But if you're intimate with the master, if you're intimate with God, you know he's not a hard man. Now, it's interesting, by that word hard, it means unyielding. How many know the word of God is not yielding? You see this all the time in the church. People have empathy for people, and so they try to change God's word to be empathetic for somebody. When you can't, God's word does not yield. Ah, but I got good news for you. His mercy is new every morning. And it doesn't matter what you're struggling with or what you're dealing with or what is attacking you. His mercy is there for you. But his word does not yield. He said, I knew you were a hard man. There's so many people that think they know things about God, but they don't. Because if you really know God, you know he's not a hard, harsh God. He's a good, loving father. The truth was he was a poor steward and he didn't know God. Here's what he said. He said, I dug a hole in the ground. I dug it in the ground and I hid your money. I asked the Lord, I said, why did he put it in the ground? Holy Spirit said to me, what is the ground? I said, it's the earth. This man took what the Lord gave him or entrusted to them and he sowed it into the world. The Lord told me to warn the creatives in our community that bad stewardship is when you use your talents for the world. But good stewardship is when you use your talents to advance the kingdom. Watch this. God said to him, you wicked Lazy servant. This is important because if you are a bad steward, it means you're either wicked or you're lazy. And at some point, the two roads cross paths and align. Poor stewards are wicked or lazy. Here's what he said. This convicted the mess out of me. Matthew 25, verse 27. Here's what the master said. He said, then you ought, or the message version said, you at least should have invested my money with the bankers. About a year ago, I was on my online banking and I saw the interest rate that I was making. And this scripture came to mind. I felt the Lord ask me, why was my money there? And he asked me, is this good stewardship? This is just me personally. Here's what he showed me. In Matthew 25, why is what Jesus said is the least we should do, most of our best? This is not financial advice. This is expanding territory advice. I felt in my spirit that there was kingdom leaders that were struggling with a spirit of fear. And I felt like that there's gonna be this spiritual provoking that's gonna to happen today where you are gonna start stepping out in faith as the Lord spoke to you and through faith expanding territory. Here's what you need to understand today is that good stewardship expands territory. Here's what the Bible said. He said, take the one from the wicked lazy one and give it to the good steward. Uh, and many Americans would say, that's not fair. But the kingdom principle is God rewards stewardship. He says, watch this. Good stewards will be given more. Ah, oh, that's why we value it. That's why we have to put a value on stewardship. Because good stewardship expands territory. Listen to this. Good stewards engage the Father's business. Good stewards manage well their time, their treasure, and their talents. Good stewards are accountable. Good stewards are rewarded. Good stewards will rule over much. Good stewards are entrusted with more. And good stewards find favor with the master. Bad stewards don't manage well. Bad stewards don't know God. Bad stewards are wicked or lazy. And bad stewards have nothing to offer their king. 
Go back to that story in 1 Kings chapter 3. This is the story of King Solomon. The two prostitutes. A rightful mother. An illegitimate mother. A good steward. And a bad steward. Scripture says that one of the women, look at this, crushed her son in her sleep. Her bad stewardship killed her future. And then she wanted what the good steward had. They're arguing with Solomon. They're arguing one of them's lying. And here's what Solomon said. He says this in verse 25. Divide the living child in two. Give half to one and half to the other. Look at this. The woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son. Oh my Lord, give the living child by, to her. By no means put it to death. Look at this. But the other said, he shall neither be mine nor yours. Divide him. See, the king tested the hearts of the mother to see which one was a good steward and which one was a bad steward by the one who was willing to divide it. See, the wicked steward was willing to divide or kill the child. The wicked mother was willing to kill the future of what she stewarded. And the rightful mother... The wicked mother said, if I can't have him, no one could have him. Watch. Mark, come and join me. And the rightful mom, the rightful steward, the good steward said, no, no, no. Let him live. He's not mine anyway. See, a good parent... A good steward knows at some point... I'm giving this baby away anyway. At some point, I'm giving this away anyway. It may be close to me right now. It may lay at my breast right now, but it is not mine. I manage the future. I manage the life. I manage the purpose. I manage the destiny. Watch, and bad stewards would rather have the thing that they manage die than someone else get it. But a good steward says, I don't have to raise it. It's as long as it lives, I don't have to raise it. As long as it fulfills its destiny, I don't have to raise it. As long as it has a future, listen, let it live. Watch, I care more about what I steward and how it makes me feel to be the owner. On May 16th, 2019, Pastor Charlie Pryor let me in this sanctuary. I was there on my knees praying for mercy culture that was in a high school. I wasn't asking God for anything. I was just loving on him. And he said, I'm going to give you this place. So I said to the Lord, then he'll never be mine. He will always be yours. Then the Lord led us to fast. So I walked around this building for 40 days. And on the first day I got to that side of the building and there's this little house over there on the property that used to be the clubhouse when this was a golf course. And when I passed that little clubhouse, I had a vision of Solomon and the two prostitutes. And I said to the Lord, if I'm the rightful mother, if we are the rightful stewards, then I ask you to give us this place. And I promise you no one will steward it better than we will. But if we're not the rightful stewards, if mercy culture is not the rightful mother, then give it to whoever it belongs to. But I promise you, if you give it to me, he will never be ours. 
he will always be yours. God gave us a supernatural miracle facility that we could disciple masses, not to draw people to ourselves. Ah, because this congregation's not ours. Waco's not ours. Espanol's not ours. Dallas is not ours. The next campus is not ours. None of this belongs to you. Here's what you don't know that I know and the elders know. The plan from the beginning is to give it all away. Good stewards understand that it never belongs to us. I might sit in this seat for 10 or 20 years. I might sit in this seat for a season. But at the end of the day, the goal is to give it all away. The goal is just to steward it. Some of you you might need to find a place to kneel. You might need to find a place to lay on the carpet. Maybe you just stand and lift your hands and some of you need to begin to tell the Lord, it will never be mine. It will always be yours. Some of you might need to take the things that you have created ownership of, that you thought belonged to you. And right now, in this holy atmosphere, begin to give it back to God. Some of you have been worrying about your, your children. Give it back to God. Nate, the election belongs to the Lord. It all belongs to the Lord. Everything we do is just to please him. Everything we do is just to steward what he gave us. It will never be ours. It's yours. Online campus, find somewhere to kneel. If you're driving in your car, you may need to pull over. Father, we declare it will never be ours. It will always be yours. I heard this so strong in my spirit. Some of you need to repent for being poor stewards. He's not a hard, mean God. Oh, do you remember when the prodigal son turned and said, man, I've messed up, but I'm gonna run back to my dad. And when he was a long way off, his father was running to him. Do you know that when you turn to God and say, Lord, I haven't been stewarding well. Lord, I've been stealing from you. Lord, I haven't stewarded my marriage well. I haven't stewarded my children well. I haven't stewarded my life well. I haven't stewarded my soul well. And when you begin to turn to him and repent, do you know that his mercy is so good? Do you know his kindness is so close? I heard this so strong in my spirit. There's those in this room that you have not stewarded your soul. Right here in this moment, just ask him forgiveness. Some of you think you're self-made and you're falling apart. Some of you have built for yourself kingdoms, but the king isn't sitting on the throne. Whatever you need to do in this moment with you and the Lord. I feel this so strong. Some of you are tormented by a spirit of fear that has to do with your children. And you need to hear a spiritual father pastor you. They're not yours. You are the steward. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, if you're struggling with fear with your family, just ask for the heart of the Father right now. Just ask him to give, give you the Father's heart right now. Father, I pray that you would give us, us your mind right now. I just feel right now that there's a moment of deliverance from just being afraid. I feel this so strong, business leaders, afraid of failure. And I feel like the Lord's just gonna take that off you right now. Some of you have not expanded territory because you are afraid, you're, fear, you're afraid of failing. And I would declare over you in this year of expanding territory, be led by the Spirit, be led of faith and be good stewards. Father, I pray right now that you would begin to minister to the hearts and the minds of your people. Hear this church be quick to repent. Uh, I feel strong in my spirit. Some of your just households are out of order. You've been asking the Lord for more, but you haven't stewarded what he's given you well. Listen, this is not a mean God, a mad dad. It's an easy, quick, Oh, I love the father of the demon-possessed boy 
when he said, Lord, would you help me overcome my unbelief? I pray this almost every day. Lord, would you just help me? Would you just help me? Would you just lift your hands all over this place and just ask the Father for his help right now? Come on, he's a good Father right now. Ask him, ask him. I felt this. Some of you don't feel like God wants to help you. Some of you feel like you're not worthy of help. Don't you know he loves his children? He loves to help his children right now. Just ask him for help. Just ask him for help. Father, I pray right now you would help us steward our emotions. You would help us steward our thoughts. You would help us steward our body. You would help us steward our resources. You would help us steward our finances. I pray that you would help us steward your presence. Father, I pray that you would give us the heart of a good steward. Father, I pray you would help these pastors steward their churches. I pray you would help them steward their leadership. I pray you would help them steward everything that you've given them. Father, I declare that it's not ours. I declare it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Here's what I heard the Lord say. Do not forget that the good stewards brought joy to the master. Do not forget that good stewards were rewarded. Do not forget that good stewards expanded the kingdom. Kids, that good stewards were given more. Hear this word today. I heard the Lord say that He has looked upon the hearts of the congregation of Mercy Culture and He has seen good stewards. I heard Him say that He was going to give more. I heard He was going to give more. I heard in my spirit that those that partnered with this prophetic word, that received this revelation, I heard Him say that He was going to give. I heard him 